Turn in your copies of God's Word to the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew, if you don't have a copy of God's Word, you can grab uh, the, the Seatback Bibles. It's page 471. And just by way of reintroduction, we are starting uh, the New Testament in our series, Every Book for All of Life. Uh, in mid-August, we finished the Old Testament. And the premise or the idea of this is that we take one book a week, kind of give an overview of it and move us towards Christ. So by, by virtue of that, we will leave a lot of meat on the bone in every one of these books. And that is especially true in the New Testament. Romans, I know a pastor who preached on that for seven years. We're giving our guy 40 minutes to do that uh, in January. So like we, and, and it's not, it's because we want to grab a meta picture, a large picture of what the Lord is doing in scripture, familiarize ourselves with themes so that we can say, man, here's how, here's how redemption started all the way in Genesis and, and threaded all the way to the New Testament, all the way to Rev, Revelation. So well, we're gonna be in Matthew this morning. Will you bow your heads with me as we invite the Lord to do uh, work in our hearts? Lord, Jesus, all of the most important things that we want, only you can do. All of the change, all of our greatest hopes and greatest desires, all that our hearts long for, to the deepest parts of who we are, only you can do, only you can provide. So we ask that your spirit would do a mighty work as we explore the book of Matthew and we see your son, we see you, Jesus, inviting people to the kingdom of heaven. So Lord, would you uh, convict us of sin, convict us of areas in our heart that are not yet yours, areas of a heart that are not conformed to the image of your son. God, I pray that there would be people here who don't yet know that at the end of this sermon, they're gonna come to know you, that your spirit is gonna move and work and change their life today. Jesus, you are our only hope. Would you remind us of that today and remind us of your power? In your name we pray, amen. One of the most important questions ever asked was asked by Jesus himself. Matthew 16, he looks at his disciples and says, who do you say that I am? It is, in point of fact, the most important question anyone can ever be asked. Who do you say that Jesus is? Is he a teacher? Is he a miracle worker? Who is Jesus? The New Testament starts with the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and all of them contribute a picture of Jesus. All of them have a theme. All of them have a part of who he is that we are meant to take and then reading in full, have a full view of who scripture wants us to understand Jesus is. To understand this in scope, we understand the term, I wanna give you a term, progressive revelation. Say that with me, progressive revelation. All we mean to understand by that is God reveals himself to us, to humanity through time. He started in Genesis and began revealing himself to Israel uh, and, and through the word of God to us. You get to the New Testament, the apex of that revelation is Jesus that progressively we've learned more about God's justice and mercy and promise and, and, and his long suffering and, and his wrath and all of that. And what we begin to see is in the gospels, we see Jesus revealing God. He comes in grace and truth, John says. So what's at stake for the next four weeks? The next four weeks, we're gonna look at the gospels and we're gonna ask ourselves, who is Jesus? If we answer that question wrongly, we miss out on eternity, we miss out on new life, we miss out on all that he promises. If we, get that, if we get that question right, if we understand who he is, our whole being, all that we are, 
is transformed. So I want to give a little bit of the background of the book of Matthew. Uh, I want to then give five characteristics of the kingdom of God, five characteristics of the kingdom of heaven, and then ask at the very end, I want to ask us all a question. Do we see ourselves rightly? Do we see ourselves rightly? Author. Matthew is the author of the book. No one can test that. It's not, he doesn't say Matthew wrote this, but church history tells us that, that, that Matthew is pretty much the undisputed, uh, the undisputed writer of this. He was a tax collector, which meant he was Jewish by birth and Roman by employment. He was a disciple. He was well off. And what we know about Matthew, we just, he was very well versed in Jewish history, very well versed in the Old Testament. It was written roughly uh, around 80, 60 to 65, so about 30 years after Jesus, 30, 33 years after Jesus was crucified, 30, 33 years after they walked with him, and sometime after the book of Mark was written. So the, the gospel of Mark was the first one to be written, and shortly thereafter, Matthew, and they seem to borrow from each other, or Matthew seems to borrow from Mark some themes, what is the structure of Matthew briefly? There's 28 chapters. It's the arrival of the king, the message of the kingdom, the rejection of the king, and the triumph of the king. I've taken this from Chuck Swindoll, and I think, I think it basically encapsulates the whole book, the arrival of the king, who he is, what is his lineage. Then for, for 10 chapters, it is him preaching and teaching in parables. Uh, from 16 to 27, it is the Jewish people rejecting Jesus and Jesus then moving towards the Gentiles and then the triumph of the king, the resurrection, and the, uh, and the sending of the disciples in uh, chapter 28. The book of Matthew argues to a Jewish audience that Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah. So why is, the Matthew, why is Matthew so important? The book of Matthew shows that Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah. It is the Jewish people who are waiting for the Messiah to come. They're waiting for the promised redemption. They're waiting for the one who would be the Prince of Peace. They're waiting for the one who, who Isaiah would say, set the captives free, who would preach freedom and victory. They're waiting for the true heir of David. And Matthew, writing to a Jewish audience in the, like, in, in, 15 verses, uses the word Christ, which is the word for Messiah, four times in the first 15 verses, and multiple references in the first four chapters to, to prophetic, prophetic fulfillment that Jesus has in the book of Matthew. He's writing to his readers, which includes us, to convince them that all God promised is finally coming true in the person and work of Jesus. That Jesus is who he says he is. And he can do what he says he can do. Matthew 4, verse 17, gives us a jumping off point for our conversation this morning. Uh, it says this, from that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, and so this is kind of the, the, the transition of his ministry. And he begins preaching, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The whole book of Matthew, the whole book of Matthew is focused on this theme, the king, the kingdom of heaven. It is the realm, it is the realm over which Jesus is king. And so a kingdom of heaven has three things with it, or, or kingdom has three things. A king who rules, subjects who obey, and a realm of authority. It is Jesus who says, I am the king of this kingdom. You are the subjects of this kingdom. And I am over everything, primarily the spiritual realm. So what does it mean that Jesus came and preached the kingdom of heaven is at hand? What does that mean? It's going to help us understand what Jesus was saying and what it means to live as people in this kingdom. That if it's true, if it's true that Jesus is Lord, that's a statement where we say we are under his authority and there's not an inch of our life under which he does not declare it is his. So what does it mean to be a part of the kingdom of heaven? Five characteristics of the kingdom of heaven. The first is that it is spiritual. It is spiritual. First characteristic of the kingdom of heaven is that it is spiritual. And it really answers the question, how do I become part of the kingdom? That we understand that there is a spiritual realm. It is real. 
Uh, and it is contested that Satan is part of the spiritual realm and God is part of the spiritual realm. Satan is contested, not in an equal way. Satan loses, but there is a realm in which our souls, do, or in which our souls are eternally a part of that Jesus is Lord over and there is a realm that we live in materially. How do I become part of this kingdom? Is it earthly citizenship in some country? Is it some measure of obedience? And where is this kingdom and how do I get in? Matthew 5, verse 3. If you want to just hold on to Matthew chapter 5 and chapter 6, we're going to spend a decent amount of time in those today. Matthew 5, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is uh, the famous start to the Beatitudes. And, and notice this. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That there are qualifications or there is, there is a, a version of, of this kingdom that only certain people will be a part of. Only certain people can or will be a part of. That if we said it the opposite way, cursed are those who are rich in spirit or arrogant in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of earth. That only certain people can and will be a part of the kingdom of heaven. In other words, the kingdom of heaven isn't about outward allegiances. What country you're a part of, what family you're a part of, uh, who you vote for, any of that. The kingdom of heaven has to do with the allegiances within our soul. So whatever it means to be poor in spirit, Whatever it means to be poor in spirit means to be a part of the kingdom of heaven. So what does poor in spirit mean? It's not about physical poverty, that it's not about whether or not you have enough money. It's not about sadness over the material loss that you have or the state of life, that, that you're just constantly morose or you look around and you're just always downtrodden. That's not, that's not what he's saying. Poor in spirit means two things. Uh, first, it is, I need God. That someone who's poor in spirit looks at their life and says, I recognize that I, I am full of sin and I have rebellion. I recognize uh, that, it's a, that, that I need God and, and I don't really want to be ruled by him. That there is this within me, this desire to rebel from him. There's a recognition being poor in spirit that we all just want to live our own way. That we don't want God to rule our lives. Poor in spirit also means to depend on God. That, that we say, I depend on God. Someone who's poor in spirit says, I have nothing good to bring to God. That there's not part of me, no obedience, no generosity that would merit his good favor. It doesn't mean we don't do good things, but it's a recognition that even the good things we do cannot outweigh the brokenness within us. Being poor in spirit means that, that I have to rely wholly on his mercy. In other words, people who are poorly, poor in spirit say, listen, if there's a heaven... If that place exists, the only hope I have of getting there is Jesus. And there's nothing I can bring to add to that. Tim Keller was famous for saying this. The gospel is this. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Yet at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. To be poor in spirit means to fully admit and to confess that we are more broken and sinful than we often say. We often confess halfway and we leave the worst parts out. We obfuscate the truth to avoid the shame of who we really are. We lie around the edges of our truth to avoid the punishment. To be poor in spirit means to look directly into our souls, directly into who we are, and realize that our hearts and our actions and our motives are more rotten than we could ever imagine. And that we are hopeless without Jesus. To be a part of the kingdom of heaven, one must believe they aren't worthy of the kingdom of heaven, that they don't deserve the kingdom of heaven, and they can do nothing on their own merit to enter the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is only available to those who are poor in spirit and recognize their only hope is Jesus. The poor in spirit then receive grace and mercy as they enter heaven. First characteristic of the kingdom of heaven, it is spiritual that, that primarily, uh, at least right now, is, it is a spiritual kingdom that will be physical. Right now it is spiritual. The second characteristic of the kingdom of heaven is that it is visible. It is visible. It answers the question, what does this kingdom look like? So if it is invisible, and we are people with souls, and he is Lord over our souls, and we are poor in spirit, and so we enter the kingdom of heaven, does this spiritual world bleed into who we are in the real world? Is there a manifestation of the kingdom of heaven in our lives? Do those who are part of the kingdom 
act differently? Are they required to act differently in the kingdom? Matthew 6.10, part of the Lord's prayer. Jesus tells all of, his, all of his followers to pray this prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And look, we, like the Lord's Prayer is one of, those, one of the most popular prayers and it's repeated and it can feel rote, almost so it can be like powerless. But it, look, look at those words. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Notice what Jesus is asking you to pray. He said, Jesus, I want your kingdom to be realized on earth. That there is some version of your rule that is not fully realized, that will be realized, but I want it here. There could be nothing better for my nation, for my country, for my city, for my state, for my family, than your kingdom to rule here. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That we're saying, God, we don't want there to be a place, a shadow in creation in which your leadership is not present. We don't want there to be an inch of the world over which you don't reside as Lord. And look, just be honest, like we, like we love this part of it. We're really good at praying it for other people, right? Your kingdom come, your will be done for all of those people on that side of the earth. Right, but what we're saying is, like, God, we want there to be no shadows of allegiance in our heart. That we want your will to be done in every recess of our soul. That we want there to be no part of our life over which you don't declare it's mine and then lead. We don't want there to be a part of our life where we don't willingly submit. So by virtue of this, the kingdom of heaven then does bleed into reality because it demands obedience. Because lords and kings are not elected. They rule Without a, without a parliament, without a Congress, without a voice, the subjects just follow. Which means, which means it means, we're talking about the king of heaven becomes visible through the obedience of his subjects. That our job is to follow, follow him, and by doing that, changing the world to make it to look as if God was in charge. Which means, let me just, a few examples. Bosses and managers. If you're a manager or a leader or a boss, how you treat your employees at work needs to reflect who Christ is and not what HR demands and not what the bottom line dictates. Christ is king over your life. Employees, how well you work in your jobs that don't pay you well or treat you well or care for you well or don't have good bosses. How well you work in those jobs is dictated by your king and not by your own desires. Students, how you work and study in universities and schools that hate your king and tell you that your king doesn't exist is dictated by your own king not by your own desires. I guess what I'm saying is, the way that we make his kingdom come, not only praying for it, asking him to do that in us, but then acting out his kingdom in every sphere of our lives. For the Christian, obedience, this is important, obedience is response to salvation. That obedience doesn't save us, and obedience doesn't keep us saved. Could you imagine that? I was thinking about that this morning. If I believed that, you know, Jesus died on the cross and, and it was tortured and beaten and all of that, but it only did 99% of the job, right, for my sin. And I said, Jesus, thank you so much for that torture you endured for my sin. To pay for my other sin, though, I'm just going to volunteer at the Boys and Girls Club and call it good. That we would somehow pay differently than Jesus for our sin? Or even on the other side, say, God, I know you loved me and I know you sacrificed, but on the other side of salvation, I'm going to work so you keep loving me. And that was really good, but I'm going to volunteer a lot to cover my sin. That we obey because we've been saved. Christianity tells us that our obedience flows from our acceptance. So how does it, like how do we make the kingdom of God visible? I think the Lord's Prayer is instructive here. So I want to just briefly like overview the Lord's Prayer and just ask ourselves kind of what, what, what we're really saying. So our Father in heaven, what we're really saying is we recognize that our rest and acceptance is by, by grace, that in fact we're able to call him Father, is a great mercy that must undergird all of who we are. Hallowed be your name. What we're saying is we will live for your glory alone, that when there are opportunities for my glory or my name or my fame or my status, that we're gonna eschew those, we're gonna move from those, we want your name to be greater than everything. So whatever we do, we're gonna, we're gonna align ourselves to give you glory 
your kingdom come, that we want your rule in this world in every part of life. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What we're really saying is we're okay with not getting what we want. That's what that means. That we're okay if we have things taken from us. We're okay if we don't get that job. We're okay if we get that job and it was a dumpster fire. We're okay uh, if my son becomes a prodigal, my daughter becomes a prodigal. We're okay if I get cancer. We're okay if this person wins the election. We're okay if this person loses the election. Whatever, that your will be done, that we're okay putting our future in your sovereign providential hands. Give us this day our daily bread, that we rely on his providence, that we reject worry and anxiety as ways of living, as if our king does not love us and see us. That we give us that, that, and forgive us our debts, that we recognize our desires are rebellious and sinful, that we recognize we need forgiveness and we freely admit our wrongs. As we also forgive our debtors, we, look, we, we give up looking down on others, that we've been forgiven, and so we give up this idea that we get to hold on to, to vengefulness or bitterness or contempt, that we can say, you know what, I've sinned differently than you, so I can look down on you, that we give that up as an ethos, as a culture, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, that we don't try to do it alone. We need the king for everything. Really what we're saying is the king has ultimate power, so we won't seek our own power. That as Christians, like our own power is not the end goal. Our own status is not the end goal. That the king forgives us, so we are to be agents of forgiveness. That the king provides for us, so we'll provide for others and won't, and won't live as if he won't provide for us. The king protects us, so we'll protect others. The king extends mercy, so we'll extend mercy. The king extends grace, so we'll extend grace. That in every sphere of society, we will seek to live out the ethic of the king. And by doing that, bring heaven to earth and his rule to others. The kingdom of heaven becomes visible as its subjects, as we live out the rule, the justice, and mercy, and values of the king. Third characteristic of the kingdom, it is subversive. It is subversive. So it's spiritual uh, that you enter the kingdom through repentance and trust and faith. And that works its way out, begins to work its way out in your life. As, as, as God's rule is seen in your life, it grows and is seen further. Third characteristic, it is subversive. That is to say, uh, we're asking, how do I live differently in the kingdom? Like what value should undergird how I live? C.S. Lewis had this quote in Mere Christianity. I want to read it. It's from his second chapter in there. It caught my eye. Christianity is a fighting religion. All right, all right. It thinks God made the world that space, time, heat, and cold, and all the colors and tastes and all the animals and vegetables that are things that God made up out of his head as a man makes up out of a story. But it also thinks that a great many things have gone wrong with the world that God made and that God insists and insists very loudly on our putting them right again. That's good. That God insists loudly, very loudly, C.S. Lewis says, that the people of God contend for the things of God in a broken world. Listen, we're in an election season, so this feels pertinent. Where worldviews and values seem to be up for debate. Elections are about worldviews. They're about how one views life, how one views justice, how one views their fellow man. And look, I just, like, as Christians, can we just acknowledge this, that our vote, just briefly, are meant to be loud proclamations of the kingdom. They just are. What a mechanism that is. Like, that, what a joy that we have that other people don't have. Right, that we can say, man, we want to partner with the good in society. We want to try to excel and, and, and create the good based on how God has designed it. And we want to reduce evil and the brokenness as God has said things are evil. And we want to, along these lines, uh, cast our vote in that way. And I just, could I just, I'm gonna ponder down this road just a second, briefly. There's this, there's this thing that kind of bugs me. This idea that Christians or churches should not be involved in politics. And everyone just like took a real sharp breath there. But, but I'm like not going where you think I'm going with it. I just, I wanna, I wanna say, look, on the one hand, that makes a ton of sense, right? Because like when, when a faith marries itself to a political party or a political idea, 
Like it, it produces, it gives birth to grief. It just does. And especially in a two-party system, it's really difficult to, to figure out how those things make a ton of sense. And the two parties now are not equal in worldview, even though they're closer than they have been. On the other hand, it's silly. Like on the one hand, it makes sense for a Christian to say, you know, we don't want to give our faith to any man-made thing because it'll never produce holiness. God has given us a worldview. He's given us this thing and has said like, the world's gonna hate you and hated me. And so we don't give all of our faith and all of our hope to a political system. But on the other hand, it is silly for a Christian to say, a church or a Christian should not, have a, should not have an opinion or a vote on things that matter. That somehow when you walk into the voting booth, your theology stops there. That somehow what the Bible says shouldn't apply to society there. Are we really saying that there are parts of our lives to which the Bible and faithful could, Christians shouldn't speak? The answer to that is no. That's absurd. That's absurd. Christianity is subversive because it requires its followers, you and I, to adhere not to the popular consent of the voice of the mob, but to the voice of Jesus and declares and demands that we give no allegiance to anything but Jesus and demands that we do our best to do that, to contend for uh, generosity, to contend for good things, to the shalom in society and do our best to reduce evil. For us to bring heaven to earth through obedience, we must recognize that the kingdom of heaven subverts every value and ethic that is valued in our society. Jesus spent some time teaching on the Sermon on the Mount and it, verses, or chapters five through seven of Matthew are just teaching after teaching after teaching that subvert the values of this world. The Beatitudes, I wanna run through them real quick and, and, and how Jesus says, blessed are these people or happy are these people when they do these things. Number three, or verse three says, blessed are those who are poor in spirit for those of the kingdom of heaven. What he's saying is humility instead of arrogance, that there is a value in the kingdom of humility, of self-awareness, of knowing who I am and knowing my need. Verse four, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. But Jesus is saying, listen, blessed are those, happy are those who show remorse instead of defiance. And the picture here is like catching a toddler lying or drawing on the wall. And he's, got, he's drawing on the wall. He says, well, no, I'm not drawing on the wall. He's got a crayon and, and, he's, and he's, he's covered in, in the wax. And he's sitting there. I said, it wasn't me. So one, one time I, I was playing golf as a six-year-old, I think, seven-year-old, in my backyard with my dad's clubs. And I, and I hit a, a, a ball into our, our screen door that had a glass bottom. And I broke it. And my dad was furious. And he goes, you broke it. And I go, well, not all the way. <laughs> it's not broken all the way. I, I was trying to minimize this idea. And I, I didn't want to get total. I didn't want to own up. Like he's saying, happy are those who have remorse about their sin and don't try to justify who they are and justify what they've done right. But blessed are those who own and are accountable. Blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Those who yield to God instead of yield to self. Meekness is, is power under control that all of us have a, 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 a spheres of authority over which we have power and not the least of which is ourselves. That we will give our power and our lives to something greater. That we will live out of someone's power in our lives. Yielding our lives in the direction of God. He continues, happy are those or blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. In other words, that the people of God will not be content with the things of this world, that our minds and hearts can't be captured by money, can't be captured by status, can't be captured by things that will not matter in three months, much less 10,000 years, that the people of God are not so easily distracted, so easily dissuaded and settling for so much less. That we say, we want to hunger for something eternal. We want to hunger for, for, for righteousness and thirst for holiness. We reject worldly ways of dealing with money, conflict, and relationships. Happy are those, or blessed are those who are merciful. The, the people of God are people who reconcile instead of stay embittered. That we, we just as a people, understand how deeply we offended God and what it costs to reconcile us to him. And because of that understanding, could not fathom could not fathom 
not extending that reconciliation to someone else. That our forgiveness doesn't allow us to stay embittered. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Happy are those who are sincere instead of insincere. And really, the, 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 it's almost a play on words. Those who, who really know who they are are at peace with, what, with who God says they are, at peace with, with how they are, and they just live life freely because they know they are accepted with God. They don't put on airs. They don't try to make themselves look better. They don't put on masks. They don't, they don't get ready to come to church and get ready to say everything's fine and, and, and put on the makeup and the nice things. They're not hypocrites. They're not hiding in the garden from God. They're walking with him. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Happy are those who are peacemakers and not instigators. Don't we just live in a world of instigation? There's so much money in it. So much money in it. The people of God are to reflect the reconciling heart of God. The people of God love to make peace. Love to extend mercy. Our heart is disposed towards people experiencing the reconciling power of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In other words, like we, we want to be persecuted for faithfulness and not punished for foolishness. That not everything, not everything in our lives, not everything that happens to us is persecution, but we want to be, we want to make sure that we are living in a way that, that if we are persecuted, if we are getting in trouble with the law, if we get in trouble with authorities, that is for faithfulness to God. Blessed are those Blessed are you when, you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you, falsely on my account, that we are hated for faithfulness instead of being ignored for faithlessness. Jesus just continues for like two or three more chapters to subvert every major value of this world. Citizens of the kingdom of heaven then renounce the pursuit of earthly power and authority for its own sake. They seek heavenly control over their life. They reject bitterness and vengeance. They live freely in God's acceptance. They prize reconciliation over instigation. They live with Christ as Lord and accept the consequences that come. Ed Stetzer, a Christian author and a, and, and a culture observer, said of these things, we are, rebellion, we are rebelling against the rebellion. That we are rebelling against the way of this world in Christ-likeness. The kingdom of heaven has a different agenda, different values. And these values give us a different worldview. And this different worldview makes us subvert this culture. Fourth characteristic of the kingdom of heaven, it is sacrificial. It is sacrificial. Spiritual, visual, visible, subversive, and sacrificial. What do I give up in the kingdom? If I come to this, surely I've got to give up something. What does is, what is my life change and what do I lose? One of the most obvious characteristics of this in, uh, in the New Testament is sacrifice. That the kingdom of heaven is one that is established not by power, not by, uh, not by military might, but by sacrifice and service. In this kingdom, in our kingdom, present day, in the earthly kingdom, power and pride rule the day. In the kingdom of heaven, humility and service are the greatest strengths. So two things the book of Matthew shows us that, that you're going to give up. First is this. Uh, we're going to give up what controls me and give up what I'm given for others. Give up what controls me. Verse 24 of chapter 16. Then Jesus told the disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. What he's saying is, listen, if you want to follow me as Lord, that the first thing you're going to do when you wake up is you're going to step off the throne of your life. That you're going to deny your dreams. You're going to deny uh, your, your, your proclivities. You're going to deny who you are not that they would never, they would never use it, but you're going to say, God, what I want for you is your kingdom to come in my life, your will to be done. And so to do that, I'm going to deny myself anything that is not of you. That we're saying we are alone his, that no other power has our heart, that no other authority has our will, no other thing, desire, or anything occupies our mind. This world encourages us to follow our desires and dreams and to listen to our hearts and follow them or pursue the things of this world as ultimate and if we're not careful, if we don't deny ourselves daily, if we, don't, if we don't wake up and say, God, I want your will to be my life, the world will take more and more and more of who we are. The kingdom of heaven demands that we deny ourselves. It also demands that we give up what I'm given for others. Matthew 20, 28. Even as the son of man, son of man came to not to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus is, is saying, listen, this is, this is the purpose. This is why I came. 
The Messiah would not be a conquering hero in the way that, uh, that Jerusalem wanted. He wouldn't be uh, on a white horse or a skilled diplomat. The Messiah, this long-awaited person, would live, uh, live and give himself up, die like a criminal in order to save many. In the kingdom of heaven, power is displayed in self-sacrifice. Why? Because we can trust the king with our lives. The true power is realizing that God is the true power, that we can give of ourselves freely. We can sacrifice of ourselves freely. We can serve freely, knowing that God is sovereign, loves us, and cares for us. Jesus' rule is one of unquestioned power. Jesus' rule is also characterized by servant love for us. So the question is, what do I, what do I give up in the kingdom? One word, everything. So I'm gonna ask you real quick, what, what do we give up in the kingdom? One word, everything. This is the stark truth of the kingdom of heaven, that all my rights, all my powers, all my desires, hopes, votes, all that, all the dreams, all of them become subject to the king of heaven. That's what it means to have a king. And have a king that is as good as ours, who is not so far off, but he's at our feet, who is not distant, but loves us closely. To get in the kingdom, it costs us our lives. But in return, we get new lives. Fifth characteristic of the kingdom of heaven is that it is proclaimed. It is proclaimed. Kingdoms and countries grow through diplomatic agreements and forceful annexations and, and, and through, through military power. But the kingdom of heaven expands through its people. Matthew 28 at the very end. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all I've commanded you. And surely I am with you to the very end of the age. The citizens of heaven are to be the proclaimers of heaven. You and I, as citizens, that's why Paul calls us ambassadors, are to be the ones who... Uh, who proclaim the good news, who are bringers of the good news, that the kingdom of heaven grows past country and borders and culture and language because the people of God go and proclaim the good news. And what is the good news? The good news is the same news Jesus preached. The kingdom of heaven is at hand, that the long-awaited Messiah has come and that the creator has come to redeem his people and that anyone can join the kingdom so long as they are poor in spirit, that they must grasp their need for forgiveness. They must trust and believe that Jesus Christ is their only hope. They must trust and believe that Jesus paid their debt. They must trust and believe that Jesus rose from the grave. They must trust and believe that he's coming back and his kingdom will be in full realization and all will be well. It is an invitation to the world to the citizens of the kingdom, to be poor in spirit, to live life as it was in the garden and as it once will be in the garden. It's an invitation to Jesus himself. We get to proclaim that the kingdom of heaven is near today in Jesus for all those who repent and believe. So one, one quick question. Do we see ourselves rightly? Do we see ourselves rightly? Do we see ourselves for those of us who, who've come to know Jesus, are we living as citizens of heaven? Are there areas of our life that we have quarantined off to the lordship of Jesus saying, you know what, you, you can't have this. Now, there's parts of my life that I can't give you. It's money, it's my status, it's my marriage, it's my kids. That this is, I just can't give this to you, that you're lord of everything else over here. But in this area, the, the kingdom of heaven has no, I just can't give it up. Maybe you're here and you don't know who Jesus is. And this idea of being poor in spirit and confessing sin is hard. Turn to Matthew 9. Matthew 9. It's this story uh, where Matthew is, is recounting. He's, he's, he's recounting Jesus coming to his house. And so there's a story about him, and he can write it however he wants, right? He could write it however he wants. Matthew 9, I'm pulling it up here because I don't have it in my notes. I thought I did. Here we go. Right? 
And so it starts in verse 9, and I'm just going to read uh, from uh, the CSB here, and you can follow along in your copies of God's Word. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, follow me. This is, remember, Matthew narrating this call. While he was reclining at the table, many tax collectors and sinners came to eat with Jesus and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked the disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Now, when he heard this, Jesus said this, it is not those who are well that need a doctor, but those who are sick. Go learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. It's Matthew looking back at that moment. Jesus came to sit with him. And at some point, Jesus looked up and said, listen, Matthew, you seem like a decent dude, but you're going to hell. (laughs) Pass the grapes, please. I don't know how long it took Matthew to calibrate in that moment, but you read this account and there's no, there's no like, but I wasn't that bad. There's no, there's no equivocation. Are there sinners among us? We're all sinners. Jesus is for us. Are there sick among us? Jesus is for us. Are there, are there among us spiritually needy people? Jesus is for you, for us. The kingdom of heaven is at hand for all those who would believe. We give up everything to join the kingdom of heaven, but we get everything. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. God, that shows us who we are, shows us who you are, and shows us what redemption looks like. God, I pray that you would make us poor in spirit, that we would accurately look at ourselves, we would know who we are in your eyes. God, that we would repent of sin and welcome forgiveness as Matthew did around the table, recognizing his need and seeing his only hope is Jesus. Oh God, would you make that our only hope, that we would give up living, living God with you as Lord, but trying to lord over ourselves. Would you help us give up parts of our lives that are not yet yours? We ask you would be tender and gracious with us, but God, we give you permission. There are parts of our lives that we can't give to you, God, that are too entrenched, that are too painful. We give you permission to do what is necessary to make us more holy. Take from us what we can't give to you, that you might give us more of your son. In your name we pray, amen.